Ephesians, like all of Paul's letters, was written to set us free. That's the purpose. Ephesians, like all of Paul's letters, was written by Paul to set sinners free, sinners like you and me. And I titled the series, But God, from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, because it captures the heart of what Ephesians is all about. I've gone back to that place on numerous occasions throughout this series, but in chapter 2, Paul, for the first three verses, describes all of our conditions when we come into this world. And he says, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, in which we once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. In other words, Paul describes the condition of human beings, every human being, when we come into this world. We don't come into this world morally neutral. We don't come into this world well disposed to God. We come into this world at enmity with God. We come into this world an enemy of God. And then something happens in verse 4 where you would think after Paul's description in verses 1, 2, and 3, he would begin verse 4 and say, and so God wiped us all out. I mean, here we are, natural-born rebels, people who have really thumbed our nose at God. We come into this world as creatures, thumbing our nose at our Creator, and therefore God is perfectly right and just to wipe us all out, but He doesn't say that. He turns everything upside down when He begins verse 4 and says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. It's amazing. I mean, if you really stop and think about it, and that's really the counterintuitive nature of God's grace. God and the inside-out nature of his grace contradicts everything that makes natural sense to us. I mean, there is an illogical flow to chapter 2. What would be logical is for him to describe what he describes about us in the first three verses and then says, as a result, God was perfectly right and just to punish us all. But he doesn't say that. He says, but God, given the condition that we came into this world in, God being rich in mercy because of his great love, raised us from the dead. And so, the nature of God's grace and what we've learned throughout this letter is this, I know what I deserve from God, and I know what I get from God, and the two don't match at all. I know what I deserve, Paul describes that beautifully, and I know what I get, the two don't match at all, and that's really the gospel of God's grace. So so Paul spends three chapters telling us about this radical one-way love of God and how that love has freed us from ourselves. And then he spent three chapters describing what this love frees us for. So he spends the first three chapters describing what this love frees us from, the burden of having to save ourselves and rescue ourselves and raise ourselves from death to life. And then he spends the last three chapters, chapter four, five, and six, describing what this love frees us for, a life of giving and service. And I mentioned two weeks ago when we were talking about the relationships that are closest to us, husband and wife, children and parents, employees and employers, coworkers, that sort of thing, all of those relationships that are inescapable. Paul describes how this vertical one-way love that comes our way minus our merit changes the way we relate to one another on the ground. It, It impacts the way that we live. It changes everything. God's grace turns everything upside down. And then here, he ends the letter by striking the main note of the gospel, believe it or not. In these verses, it just, it appears like this is nothing more and nothing less than a final greetings, a, you know, sort of sanctified goodbye, but there's a lot more going on here when you pay attention to what these verses say. And in these verses, he really strikes the main note of the gospel, and by doing so, he summarizes everything that he has said in the book. 
He summarizes the first three chapters and he summarizes the last three chapters because by striking the main note of the gospel here in these verses, he summarizes what we've been freed from and what we've been freed for. And what he does here is he names he names all of those things that we long for and work to attain all of our lives. He names these things. Peace and love and faith. And at first glance, it may not sound like those are the things that we long for, that all of us long for, that all of us dream about, but he names those things. And then he goes on to describe how we long for those things and uh, what God has done to meet those longings. Now, I, I don't know about you, um, but I'm exhausted, okay? I am. I mean, I, and everybody I talk to, every single person I talk to as a pastor is also exhausted. I mean, I, I, I was thinking about this not long ago, uh, and, you know, after I turned 40, I started to become much more reflective. You know, I mean, half of your life is over, probably more than half of my life is over, um, but half of your life is over. The second half goes a lot faster than the first half. Um, and so I was thinking about my life and I was thinking about the whole idea of exhaustion because I, I'm exhausted, and everyone I talk to seems exhausted. And as I was thinking about my life and the various stages in my life, I can remember when I was a teenager, and life was brand new in many ways, and all of my experiences were first-time experiences, and I was exhausted as a teenager. You know, you're trying to leave your mark, you're trying to figure out who you are. That can be exhausting. And then at 21 years old, Kim and I got married, and we had our first child at 22, and our second at 24, and our third at 28. There was, uh, you know, there was a method to our madness. Uh, when we got married young, had children young, and the whole point of that was to get them out while we were still young. Um, and, you know, I think about our 20s, and, you know, we were exhausted when our kids were small. You know, I mean, we couldn't wait to get past the exhaustion years of sleepless nights and potty training and constant colds and all of that stuff. Now, my three children are 18 and 16 and 11, and we're even more exhausted. Okay? I mean, we, we still experience sleepless nights for an entirely different reason than we did when we were in our 20s, but um, in your 20s, you're exhausted trying to figure out who you are and how you're going to spend your life. You get exhausted dreaming dreams and hoping beyond hope that you'll amount to something. I remember that going on in my 20s, you know, uh, God saving me at 21 years old and um, you know, I mean, my life was brand new, and having to think through, dreaming dreams, hoping beyond hope that, you know, your life will amount to something. What am I going to do now? You know, I've got my whole life ahead of me. Well, those things can be exhausted, exhausting too. And then you get to your 30s, and you're exhausted because you're well into your profession, and you're trying to make your mark, um, and you add to that that most people are getting married and having kids in their 30s. That adds to our exhaustion. And then in your 40s, you're exhausted because your kids are teenagers. If you had them in your 20s or 30s, your marriage isn't everything that you hope for, okay? I mean, I can't tell you how many people that I talk to who maybe got married in their early mid-20s, and now they're in their early mid-late 40s, and things at home aren't nearly as satisfying as they thought they were going to be when they said, I do the day they got married. Life is hard and relationships aren't easy and that gets exhausting. And, and then you're exhausted in your 40s because you're neck deep in your work and you're trying so hard to justify your value. You know, I mean, you, you start realizing, okay, I'm not in my 20s anymore. <laughs> I'm well, into my, I'm well into my professional years, and I don't know about you, but uh, there have been those flashes for me where I think back to when I was, you know, 25, 26, 27 years old, and I fast forward now to almost 41, and there are a variety of different areas where I go, I thought I'd be further along than this. You know, you, I remember when my dad turned 40. I remember his birthday, his 40th birthday. I remember my mom's 40th birthday. And I remember thinking they were so old, you know? 40 sounded just so old. And here I am, you know, almost 41, and thinking, gosh, I really thought I would be 
further along than this in a lot of different ways. I thought I would be a better husband by now. I thought I would be a better parent by now. I thought that I would have learned all of the lessons that I needed to learn by now. I thought I would be the kind of man that I always wanted to be by now. And, you know, that can be exhausting as you reflect on your life and you start thinking about regrets and all of those things. Um, and, you know, is my life everything that I dreamed it would be? That, that becomes exhausting. And by the time you get beyond 50, physical exhaustion starts to take over. You know, you just can't do the things that you used to do. And maybe now by the time you're in your 50s, your children are getting married and that brings a whole new challenges to you. You're experiencing the newness of empty nestness and that brings challenges to your marriage. And you know, you're thinking about your career and your career is nearing its end. Maybe it'll be over in 10, 15 years and you start becoming reflective of that. And so literally I was thinking about every decade of my life and the ones that are to come going, is there any decade, any season in the life of a human being that is not marked by exhaustion? And the answer is no. And no wonder we're all exhausted. Uh, We've been exhausted since we came into this world. I mean, for the most part. Um, And so, you know, I started thinking about that in connection with these verses and started thinking about the fact that life requires many, many things from us. You know, the demands are thick out there. I mean, life demands a successful career, a stable marriage, successful children, a certain quality of life. We all have dreams, we have aspirations, we have hopes, and when life gets hard and things don't seem to be turning out the way that you had always hoped they would turn out, uh, the hardworking work harder. And so, is it any wonder that we're, we're tired? I mean, we do our best to do better, to do more, and to do now. And as you get older and you realize things haven't panned out the way that I had always hoped they would pan out, uh, every, in other words, every single person in this room, whether you think your life is good or bad, has experienced, is experiencing, and will experience a shattered dream of some sort, okay? A shattered dream. Um, you know, I talked to people who had wonderful hopes and dreams when they got married and then they're in their mid-30s and they get divorced. Or they had wonderful hopes and dreams about their children and how their children would turn out and now their children are getting older, maybe they're out of the house, they're married, they're having their own children and, um, you know, their life hasn't turned out the way that you had hoped it would turn out. Or this happens professionally. Every single person at some level has experienced shattered dreams, disappointments, unmet expectations in a variety of different ways. And when that happens, when that happens, we we do our best to do better and to do more and to do now. As you get older, you, you actually start working harder because in your mind, you're running out of time, you know? I mean, I gotta get this right. I mean, anyone living inside the guilt, anxiety, and uncertainty of daily life knows from instinct and hard experience that the weight of life is heavy. So the question is, what what causes this exhaustion? I mean, what really causes it? Is it just because life is hard and circumstances aren't what you always hoped it would be? Is that... Is that the cause of our exhaustion? I think Robert Capon gets to the heart of it when he says this really gets to the heart of the cause of this exhaustion when he writes, life is a web of trials and temptations, but only one of them can ever be fatal, he says. So life is a web of trials and temptations, but only one of those trials and temptations can ever be fatal. The temptation to think that it is by further, better, and more aggressive living that we can have life. And that's the irony. When we start to feel our exhaustion, we try to perform our way out of it. I mean, it's natural to paddle harder and to kick faster when you feel like you're drowning because from our standpoint, we're actually working to save ourselves. And what are we working for? I mean, what are we actually working to attain? We're we're working to achieve the love and the faith and the peace that we long for. That's what we're working for. You may have never thought about it that way. You may have never uh, articulated it that way to yourself. 
But the fact of the matter is our exhaustion has a lot less to do with what's going on outside of us, a lot more to do with what's going on inside of us, and our exhaustion is the result of our fighting to attain and to achieve the love and the faith and the peace that we long for. So let me just describe how this works, okay? How, how do we work for love? How do we wear ourselves out working for love? Well, it comes in a variety of different ways, but one way would be if I can become a certain way, maybe I'll find the love I need to make me happy. Okay, if I can just, if I can improve myself, if I can look better, if I can act better, if I can portray myself better, um, then maybe I can, maybe I will find the love that I need to make me happy. Okay, we work for it. Maybe, maybe if I become someone, I will get love from society that I feel like I need in order to be happy. Maybe if I become a better parent and I listen to my children more, I will, I will attain for myself the love from my children that I so desperately need in order to be happy. Or maybe you're not married and you think, if I can just become a certain way, if I can just change, then maybe I will get the love that I feel like I need in order to be happy and satisfied. Or maybe you are married. And your husband or your wife has been bickering about how you need to change for years and years and years, and now you're really going to get down to business, and you are really going to try hard and do more because what you've concluded is that love from my spouse is what will establish me and justify my existence. We do it in a thousand different ways. If I can become someone, maybe my colleagues will love me. I'll get the love that I need from my colleagues so that I can, so that my existence will be validated so that I'll, I can feel like I matter. Well, how do we work for faith and trust? This is an interesting one. I had to think through this a lot yesterday. If I can clean up my act and overcome my vices, maybe I'll start believing in myself and gain the confidence in me that I need in order to be happy. Okay, so we, we work hard, we wear ourselves out trying to, trying to trust ourselves, to have faith in ourselves, but it goes a different way too. We become exhausted demanding trust from others. We become tired when we demand that other people become trustworthy. And what's interesting is, as I was thinking through this, and this is really a key issue, because trust is such an important thing. And you know, we work hard to make ourselves trustworthy. We work hard to uh, demand trustworthiness from other people. And we say that trust is something you have to earn. We almost say it instinctively, you know? Well, trust is something you have to earn. I say that as a parent, okay? I mean, I say that to people. I think that even when I don't say it. Trust is really something you have to earn. But do you understand, okay? Uh, it's not true, okay? It's not true. It's just, it's just simply false because no one ever proves trustworthy enough. If you're waiting to trust me in order, if, if you're waiting to trust me until I become trustworthy, you'll be waiting the rest of your life. And if I'm waiting to trust you in order, in, or, if I'm waiting to trust you um, so that you become trustworthy or if I'm waiting for you to become trustworthy in order for me to trust you, I'll be waiting the rest of my life. The fact of the matter is, when you really start to think about it, trust is always a risky gift. Always. It's love given to a sinner who will inevitably disappoint you. Always. Okay? I mean, no one's trustworthy. All right? So we can either go through life exhausting ourselves by demanding that people become trustworthy, by demanding that we ourselves become trustworthy so that we can experience some settledness, um, or uh, we come to the freeing realization that I'm not as trustworthy as I ought to be, and they're not as trustworthy as they ought to be, and um, trust is never something that we can fully and finally earn. Because I'm telling you, the people that you trust the most, there are things about them that aren't trustworthy, okay? Things that you may know or things that you may not know. I mean, trust is always a risky gift that we give, love given to a sinner that will inevitably disappoint you, that will inevitably let you down. Um, well, how do we work for peace? Gosh, I mean, we do this in 
50,000 different ways. I mean, if, if I can build an ideal life and if I can build an ideal family and make enough money, I'll attain the peace and settledness that I need to be happy. Okay, if I can, if I can fix people, you know, we do this all the time. If I can just fix people, if I can change people, if I can change my children, if I can change my spouse, if I can change those around me, if I can change me, um, you know, then I'll experience the peace and the settledness that I long for. If I, can, if I can just work my whole life to get other people to agree with me and see life from my vantage point, I'll experience peace. I've said this before, but the first five years that Kim and I were married were the hardest years of our marriage. And the main reason for that is because I had concluded that if she would just become more like me, everything would be easy, you know? And she concluded that if I could just get him to become more like me, life would be easy. In other words, peace, the peace that both of us longed for was riding on our shoulders and our efforts to change one another. If I can change her, then I'll experience peace. If she can change me, she'll experience peace. Well, we do that all the time. If I can just get people to approach all of life and see things from my vantage point, I'll experience peace. If I can just, if I can win, I'll experience peace. If I can, if I can control my world, if I can create a world that I can control, then I'll experience peace. Um, and when we feel the pressure to attain these things, love, peace, and trust, life becomes exhausting. Exhausting. That's the real reason we're exhausted. The real reason we're exhausted is not just because we're broken people living in a broken world with other broken people. I mean, things outside of us are hard. We know that, okay? I mean, relationships are hard. This world is a hard place to live in. We, we, we get that, but is the real cause of our exhaustion, is the real cause of our exhaustion something that's going on outside, or is the real cause of our exhaustion something that's actually taking place on the inside? You see, we're exhausted not simply because life is hard, we're exhausted because we're trying to save ourselves. That's why we're exhausted. We're trying to achieve and attain those things that always seem just a little bit out of our reach. And insofar as love, trust, you know, faith, and peace name what we want but can't get, they either become a whip that drives us on in the futile rat race of life, or they become an unobtainable dream that drives us to despair. Either one, okay? That, so the real difference is all the, these things that we want, these things that we long for, these things that drive us, are they things that we attain and achieve, or are these things that are given and received? You see, Contrary to what we have come to believe, powerlessness is the beginning of freedom and rest. It's the very opposite of what this world will tell you. The very opposite. This world will tell you that the more independent you become, the freer you will be. The more powerful you become, the freer you will be. But what Paul does throughout this letter, especially in those two words, but God, is to show that Actually, the more dependent we become, the freer we will be. The more powerless we realize we actually are, the freer we will be. It doesn't mean that things on the outside will necessarily get easier. In some cases, they might get harder. But the fact of the matter is, when we cease our striving to attain those things we think we need in order to be happy, in light of the fact that God freely gives sinners those things that we long for, we actually begin to find rest. We actually begin to find freedom. So Paul ends this letter right where he began it, with pure gift. Pure gift. That's how he opens the letter, okay? Grace and peace to you, he says. And then he goes on to describe in verse 3 through 14, he goes on to describe this remarkable work of God before the foundation of the world, giving to sinners what sinners could never get for themselves. And so he ends, he ends here 
right where he began with the notion of pure gift, the notion of God sovereignly distributing amazing grace to people who don't deserve it. I mean, peace, love, and trust, according to Paul here, are not prizes that we achieve. They are gifts from God that we receive. I mean, notice he says this so clearly in verse 23, peace, love, and faith are to us. They come our way from where? Where do these things come from? They, they come to us from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so our deepest desires and dreams, the dream of being loved, of having the space to exhale, you know, that's, that's peace. I mean, just the space to, to realize that I'm going to fail, you know? Um, I'm going to fail and other people are going to fail me. I'm going to disappoint others and other people are going to disappoint me. Uh, I, am, I am never going to be able to satisfy in my own power all of my hopes and dreams and accomplish all of those things I think I need in order to be happy. And so our deepest desires and dreams, the dream of being loved, the dream of experiencing the peace by having the space to exhale. Uh, you know, I've said this before. But only the gospel can cause us to revel in our expendability. It's amazing. You know, we're all expendable. We'd like to think we're not. We'd like to think that this world really, really, really needs us. And there's nothing better than just a cursory study of history to realize that some of the greatest people who ever lived within two generations, for the most part, are forgotten. I mean, they may, there may be something about them in a history book or whatever. This sometimes happens to people who are still alive. Okay? I mean, it's been amazing to me, for instance, um, that my granddad's 94 years old. You know, I mean, 25 years ago, it was hard to talk to anybody, Christian or not, 30 years ago, who didn't know who he was, you know? Now you talk to, you know, gosh, teenagers or kids, they don't even know what, you know? They, there's a wrestler named Superstar Billy Graham that they think might be him, um, you know, but whatever. I mean, you know, I mean, they, so this happens. This happens when you're alive as well to people. Um, and, you know, I mean, the gospel frees you to experience the peace that you need to revel in your expendability because Jesus was extraordinary for you. You're free to be ordinary. It's amazing to me. Um, so unbelievably liberating. Well, that's given to us. We, we, we experience peace when when we can actually be honest about ourselves and come to the realization that we're not the super people that we like to think we are. We're not the powerful people that we, that we like to think we are. So much of what the gospel does is not only free you from what other people think about you, but it frees you from what you think about yourself. It frees you from the pressure to define yourself and to somehow experience peace by making something of yourself, by getting your point across or however else we do it. Um, and so our deepest desires and dreams, the dream of being loved, of having the space to exhale, of relating to someone who is unfailingly faithful, all of those things are, are given in the Gospels. I mean, look at Romans, Romans um, chapter 5, a couple places. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the gospel, we're freely given peace. And then, Romans 5, 8. Paul says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In the gospel, we are freely given love. These things, peace and love, come our way. These aren't things we work for. These aren't things we strive to achieve. These are things that are given to sinners for free without doing anything. As I've said before, the only thing we contribute to this gift is the sin that makes it necessary. That's our contribution. These things come our way for free. And then Romans 10, 17, Paul says, so faith, trust, comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So all these things, 
peace and love and faith, trust, come our way for free. So the letter doesn't end, okay? This is, and this is a snapshot of the Christian life as a whole. The letter does not end by naming our deepest desires and dreams and encouraging us to reach for the stars, okay? It doesn't say if you just do more and try harder, you can become a better you. And if you become a better you, you'll be happy. It doesn't say that, okay? Some of the most unhappy people you and I have met are people who have accomplished everything they thought would make them happy. You know, the loneliest moment in life is when you have just accomplished what you thought would deliver the ultimate and it has let you down. That's it. I've told you about that interview that Tom Brady, the quarterback for the New England Patriots, had with uh, 60 Minutes after he won his first Super Bowl. And, uh, I mean, he, the pinnacle of his career, you know, young guy, um, and he wins the Super Bowl, quarterback for the Patriots, wins the Super Bowl. This is what I've been dreaming about my whole life. I mean, this is it. This is the equivalent of whatever it is you do being the absolute best at doing it. And he accomplished it. And he, in a moment of sobriety and honesty, says to the interviewer on 60 Minutes, that, that didn't even last a week. I woke up the next morning and said, that's it? I've been working my whole life to accomplish this goal? I've accomplished it? That's it? I mean, and so... Unfortunately, in Tom Brady's case, he concluded that, well, the only way to satisfy this deep longing is to go out and win another one. And then after the second one, he said, that's it? I thought two would be more satisfying than one. Well, the only way to satisfy this deep longing is to go out and win another one. And he did. And he's been trying ever since and failing. So if success doesn't reach you, sorry, calorisos, Big Patriots fans. My assistant, Julie, and her family are big Patriots fans. It's a terrible time to be a Patriot fan. They're like going down, going down. The Cowboys are going up. Um, uh, so, um, I mean, if, if success doesn't satisfy, failure often can bring about sobriety. You know, that's what I'm saying. When powerlessness is the doorway to freedom. Okay, when you realize, no matter how hard I try, no matter, I mean, I, I think if my kids turn out to be the way that I always hope they turn out, maybe then I'll be happy. Well, then they do. And you go, that's it? I mentioned a number of weeks ago that I was sitting with a guy who's basically accomplished everything he ever set out to accomplish, has experienced more success than all of us put together in this room, literally, okay? Literally. Um, and he looked at me a few weeks ago and said, I mean, I'm in my mid-60s now and I'm looking around at all of the success that I've experienced and I'm thinking to myself, is this it? You know, is this it? Well, you've heard those stories. You've talked to those people too. So the letter doesn't end by naming these deepest desires and dreams and encouraging us to reach for the stars. The letter ends by naming our deepest desires and dreams and announcing that the dream has come true. <laughs> it's come true. In other words, we don't live for peace, which as you know is anything but peaceful. We live from peace. We don't live for it. We live from it. There, there's a big difference between those two things. I wrote, I experienced this this past week. Um, I was on a plane coming home last Saturday from Dallas, and I, uh, I wrote a blog post, a reflection about an episode in uh, my life where my dad showed me extreme grace and mercy. Um, and it was that episode that God used to eventually bring me back to God. Okay? I mean, it was, this, it was the kindness and the grace that my dad showed me in a moment that not only um, I didn't deserve it, but I took total advantage of it. Okay? I mean, basically the story goes like this. Uh, I, was, I dropped out of school, high school when I was 16 and got kicked out of my home when I was 16, and, um, and I was on my own. 
And uh, I had, you know, gone from job to job to job, and I was a real loser, a real loser. Um, and I went, was going from job to job to job, and I remember losing one of my jobs at one point, and you know, for, I don't know, it's because I didn't show up, or I came in late for the 500th time, or something like that, and whoever my boss was at the time said, okay, that's, you know, that's enough, uh, you're done. And I remember calling my dad and saying, rent's due and I don't have any money. And my dad said, well, what happened to your job? And I made up some story, some lie about cutbacks or something like that. So my dad said, well, meet me at Denny's in 30 minutes. And he said, meet me at Denny's because if my mother knew that he was doing this, it would have been bad news. So he says, meet me at Denny's in 30 minutes. Uh, so I met him at Denny's and he asked me about my job and asked me what happened and I made up some story and all those sorts of things. So uh, he gave me a blank check, wrote, you know, s signed it, handed it to me and said, write this out for whatever you need, this should hold you over. So not only did I, I said, you know, thanks. And not only did I write it out for more than I needed, but I became a master at forging his signature and there would be times when I would sneak into my mom and dad's house, find my dad's checkbook, and forge a signature, and write checks for $300, $500, $700, whatever it is I needed or wanted, and cash them, okay? It's terrible, okay? Don't copy this. Um, and uh, I mean, I went one time without a job for six months because I was just forging checks and cashing checks. And um, it wasn't until later that my dad told me he saw those checks being cashed. So you know, seven, eight, nine checks being cashed, and never said anything, okay? Just let it go. I mean, my parents had tried everything, homeschool, Christian school, uh, public school. They kicked me out of the house. I mean, counseling, they tried everything. Um, and so here was something that my dad was going to try, extreme, unmeasured grace. And uh, it was that literal turning of the other cheek that demonstrated to me something of the radicality of God's love and mercy to sinners. Because after all, we are all a lot worse than simple, you know, check stealers, okay? I mean, our offense to God is infinitely greater than taking checks from our parents and forging signatures. Um, and it was that act, it was that act of kindness that eventually led me to repentance, okay? So I retell this story on my blog. And I mean, now my dad's dead, he died in 2010, all right? I cannot even begin to tell you the amount of vitriolic comments that came in to my blog that the moderator had to spam, spam, just out of respect for my dad. I mean, he was ungodly, he was unwise, this is, you know, anti-everything the Bible says, blah, 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 blah. And then there were others out there who wrote blog posts Okay, I mean, just raking my poor deceased father over the coals. Um, and I mean, every bit of emotional and intellectual um, energy that I had wanted to go and just, I mean, rake these people over the coals. Are you even Christians? I mean, do you not know that the kindness of the Lord led you to repentance? You know? Um, how in the world? I mean, did you not read the part where I said my dad was dead? Okay? It was unbelievable. Okay? I mean, I couldn't believe it. The disrespect, it was unbelievable. That's the kind of reaction that grace sometimes generates from law-locked hearts, by the way. You know, it's the most offensive thing in the world. How dare, no. I mean, it's the most offensive thing in the world. Okay? And that came out. And every part of me wanted to defend. Every part. And I didn't. I can't tell you the restraint. I really thought if I can go and vindicate my dad and show these people for the idiots that they are, I will find peace, you know? I will get peace for myself by raking these people over the coals. I can out-argue them, there's no question about that, okay, great, you know, I can find peace in that too, confidence in me, you know. Um, but I mean, if I can just, if I, if I can go out and defend, then I'll experience the peace that I want. I mean, it was in many ways exhausting just going through that this week because the wrestling match inside of me, if I'm going to experience peace, this is so unjustified. If I'm going to experience peace, then I have to, I have to do something, okay? Um, fact of the matter is the gospel frees you from the enslaving pressure to defend yourself. 
and retaliate when you've been wronged in order to get peace. In other words, it frees you from the need to win. So I did experience peace this week uh, by being reminded of the peace that I already have that's been given to me, not by going out to try and do something that would gain me peace. I, if I could just fall asleep, you know, you've had this, you have this internal struggle. I'll, I would sleep much better tonight if I just knew that I had properly defended myself. You know, we think that. Uh, if I could just teach these people a lesson, I will find peace and sleep easier at night. You know as well as I do that that doesn't last very long. Um, and so, in my experience this week, I did experience peace, but it was not the result of defending myself or defending my dad or teaching these people theology 101. Okay, that wasn't it. Um, it, it came as a result of realizing I didn't need to defend myself. I didn't need to win. Um, and we don't, we don't live for love. We live from love. I mean, that's such a remarkable, remarkable and liberating thing that we have been fully, finally, and forever loved. We don't need to work for it. We work from it. And that when we realize that we have been fully, finally, and freely, and forever loved, that liberates us to love others without needing anything in return. So now, life doesn't have to be an exhausting exercise of extracting love from you, okay? Life can be lived in the freedom of knowing that I am fully, finally, forever loved by God in Jesus, so now I can love you recklessly and sacrificially without needing you to love me in return. I mean, think about this. Do we love more when we doubt that we're loved? Or think about this, okay, in a moment where you doubt that you're loved and you're trying to earn love from someone. And so you work hard to do the right things and say the right things and all that stuff because it would really, really establish your existence if you could get love from this person. Is that real love for that person? It's actually love for yourself, <laughs> okay? Because you're, you're trying to get something from them. You need something from them in order for you to be happy. And so you're doing all of these things when you, when you doubt that this person loves you, when you doubt that your spouse loves you, and you decide, I'm going to work hard to get their love so that I can feel like I matter. You're in those moments where you're trying to get their love. You're not actually loving them, you're loving yourself. You're, you're taking something from them uh, for yourself. So do, do we love more when we doubt that we're loved and are trying to secure some affection? Or... Do we love more when we know that we're loved? <laughs> you know, when there's this great unwavering confidence that you are loved, it actually produces a responsive love. So this idea that, well, if, if we speak too loudly and too clearly about God's unwavering love for sinners, that God doesn't love me more when I'm doing well, and God doesn't love me less when I'm not doing well, because nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Um, if we say that too much, you know, I mean, people will just take advantage of it, and, and they'll just sort of, you know, go off the deep end. Well, the fact of the matter is, you know, that's not true even horizontally. Okay, what happens to a heart that knows it is deeply loved? I've said this before, I mean, so many different times and in so many different ways, but when, when let's say, Kim uh, is being kind to me and loving me uh, in the context of me being a jerk, does that make me want to be more of a jerk? Okay? It, no, it doesn't. It makes me want to stop being a jerk and to say I'm sorry and to love her. Okay? Um, so. We, we don't live for love. That's so exhausting. We live from it. And we don't live keeping score to earn or give trust. I mean, that's earning trust or giving trust. You know, we wear ourselves out, as I said before, trying to earn trust by becoming trustworthy, or I'm only going to give trust to people who prove themselves to me. That's exhausting, okay? Um, we don't live life keeping score to earn or give trust. We live loved by the one who alone is trustworthy and faithful. So all these things that name our deepest desires, 
trust or faith, uh, love, peace, these things that are at the root of basically all of our pursuits in life, um, all of these things are given. They're not things that we achieve. These are things that we receive from God. So we long for peace and we long for love and we long for trust and we spend our lives trying to get what can only be given. But the good news of Ephesians is that while we were trying to save ourselves by pursuing these things, God in the great contradiction of grace gifted the very things we've been dreaming of all our lives. Let me just um, close with this. Brennan Manning, who uh, wrote a number of different books, um, died a couple of weeks ago. He was, if you know anything about Brennan Manning, then you'll know that he was a lifelong alcoholic who spent his life ferociously battling the demon of addiction. And in his books, he was uncomfortably transparent about his weaknesses and failures. Uncomfortably. People didn't like him because of that, actually. Um, and ironically, according to 2 Corinthians 12, 9, that actually made him a prime candidate to teach us something of God's scandalous grace. Uh, when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, it is in our weakness that God flexes his muscles and shows us how strong he is. It's in our powerlessness that God reveals his power. I mean, just as a side note, Every addict I've ever known has taught me something about God's grace that I would have never known otherwise. I, and, I, and I have in my life, okay? I have people in my life um, who uh, have had lifelong addiction problems. And, you know, they, there's nothing like an addict uh, who understands something of their powerlessness, you know? And uh, they may struggle for the rest of their lives, you know? I mean, if, if alcoholics know this. You know, I mean, you, you, I know many who struggle for the rest of their lives. Brendan Manning was one of those guys. He's a, a drunk, and then you'd get sober, and then he would become a drunk again, and then you'd get sober, and it was almost like his life was an expression of Paul saying, a wretched man that I am who will rescue me from this body of death. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I keep doing those things. Where is my hope? I look to the hill. Where, where will my hope come from? Is it going to come from some mustering up of willpower inside of me? Well, Paul tried that and said, I, that's, a, that's a dead end. It's an absolute dead end. Um, but every, every addict I've known, because they're so aware of their powerlessness, has taught me something about God's grace that I would have never known otherwise. Well, a couple years ago, maybe a year and a half or so, uh, before he died, uh, Brennan Manning wrote uh, his autobiography called All is Grace. It's a painful read. I actually read the first four or five chapters on a plane and had to stop. It was so painful. Just because he's so honest and transparent about the dysfunction of his life and finally was able to pick it up again at some point and read the, the parts where he's just, you know, exulting in God's amazing grace. I mean, he, he really was. His, his most famous book was called The Ragamuffin Gospel because he understood so much that he was a ragamuffin, and it just showcased the glory and the grace and the mercy of Jesus. But uh, the last year, a uh, few years of his life, because of his alcohol addiction uh, for years, uh, he really, really suffered. I mean, he basically became an invalid. And this is what he wrote in his autobiography. I have said countless times that losing our illusions is difficult because illusions are the stuff we live by. Think about that for a moment. That's a powerful sentence. In other words, it's when we, it's when we, it's so hard to finally be comfortable with the fact that we're powerless, you know? I've said countless times that losing our illusions is difficult because illusions are the stuff that we live by. We believe we're invincible until cancer comes knocking. Or we, or we believe we're making a comeback until we tumble down the stairs. God strips away those falsehoods because it is better to live naked in truth than clothed in fantasy. The last few years, he says, have been a stripping away like I've never experienced. About all I'm left with now is rags, somewhat fitting, I guess, for a man who has preached such a gospel. If ever I was a ragamuffin, I am now. For ragamuffins, God's name is mercy. Or in the present vernacular of my life, God's name is help. 
Nowadays, if I want to put on my jeans and shirt, someone has to help me. If I want to eat a slice of pepperoni pizza from Pete and Elda's or an ice cream cone, someone has to help me. If I go to the bathroom, I need help. To turn up the volume on the Yankees game, I need help. To access my medicine or open my Diet Coke, I must have help. To get into bed at night, I need help. To rise in the morning, help. To nap in the afternoon, help. To write this book, help. Carlo Coretto wrote, we are what we pray. These are days of prayer without ceasing. And my prayer is simple. Help me. Have mercy on me. And my father, who is very fond of me, does. So what's, what's the cure? We know what the cause of our exhaustion is. It's ultimately trying to save ourselves by attaining these things that Paul names. Well, if that's the cause, what's the cure? The cure is realizing that the dream has come true, that in the person and work of Jesus, God has sweepingly secured all that our hearts long for, and He gives that to sinners like you and me for free. That should make life lighter, lighter. It should make relationships more enjoyable. Um, it, should, it should make the things that we pursue something that we enjoy and not something that we need in order to establish our existence. We are not what we do. We are what Jesus has done for us.